Hey, Andy, how's it going? Uh, he's he's deafened. Uh -huh. Hi, good morning. Oh, there we go. Good to talk to you. Glad to have you here. Very nice. Hi, hello, hello. Boy, there's uh, there's a bunch of people here. This is cool. I, uh, <laughs> I haven't checked out this this Discord yet. Um, is this is this kind of like a like a fan thing? Is is this organized by by Peter? Uh, it's not organized by him. He's aware of it, unfortunately, because okay, of his cool, cool. ascetic devotion to a focused life. He will not join. But anyway, he is. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I feel I feel like uh, he's he's really one up to me there. I, I had a, uh, uh, you know, like a lighter version of that. It's like, no, I can't really join a <laughs> Discord. Uh, I mean, you, you probably under understand the, the right, way in which absolutely. it uh, absolutely absolutely uh, cr creates challenges. Uh, but I, I can, you know, do, do like a one-off scheduled chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that, hey, everybody, on that I, note, I people were very. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. I can't. I can't actually tell who's talking. Um, oh. So who who is it that's speaking right now? Oh, my name is my name is Xander. My username is Strategy Pattern, but you can call me whatever you like. And, Hi, Xander. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you. And so basically, everybody is very excited about this. So that's why there's a lot of people here. And we were originally thinking that we would just let anybody talk. But we figured since there's so many, it would get kind of messy. So we've actually prepared some questions for you. And it's mostly going to cool. be James and I asking you a question. And then as much as we would like it to have a structure of a conversation, we're going to try to keep it to the questions to cover as much ground as we can. And it's just going to be all right. us alternating. And then if people ask a good question in real time, we'll try and ask that and go from there. That sound good? Cool. That, yeah, that all sounds all right. right. I should say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm by no means like a Discord power user, so I'm going to pretty much just uh, put all of that in, in your hands. I'm not going like, to pay attention to, to chat or anything like that. Fair enough. That's what we'd prefer. Cool. All right. So I think James has the first question for you. Absolutely, yeah. So there's this really interesting note you've written. Um, athletes and musicians pursue virtuosity and fundamental skills much more rigorously than knowledge workers do. And in this note, you basically say that Athletes work very intensely on drills. Musicians work on their scales very intensively. But knowledge workers rarely uh, have a sort of deliberate practice schedule. Um, and at the bottom of the note, you pose this question, what might it mean for knowledge workers to fanatically pursue virtuosity in their fundamental skills? And basically, I'd just love for you to answer that question that you posed here. <laughs> um, and uh -huh. I'd love to know what you think the ideal training of a knowledge worker would look like. <clears throat> well. Uh, to be clear, James, I, I would love to be able to answer that question too. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to expand on it. I mean, I, I think it's a that's a research agenda right there. That's not the it's not a question I can lightly answer. Um, first, just some of you know what we know, more background that that I didn't capture into these notes. Um, Anderson in, in his pieces makes sorry, Anderson Erickson in his pieces makes these uh, arguments that. Uh, knowledge work is more difficult because uh, to, to do deliberate practice with because it's this sort of wicked domain by contrast to these domains in music and athletics in which um, it, it is well understood what virtuosity and success look like with the skills uh, it is known how to make progress uh, that is that there's like a corpus of practice techniques and skills for building skill, kind of at that metal layer. Uh, it is easy to evaluate skill. Uh, there's there's rapid and fine-grained feedback uh, during practice sessions. There is uh, uh, kind of a culture in which uh, some number of eminent performers in the discipline uh, become uh, trainers or, or coaches themselves, uh, which leads to growth and knowledge of, of the, at, the, at that metal level. And by contrast, in, in knowledge work, uh, we have this challenge that the skills are not well characterized. Um, it, 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 they're difficult to evaluate. It's not clear what success would look like. Uh, for the most part, there isn't a corpus of knowledge about how to actually develop skills um, in, in many core knowledge work skills. Um, and there isn't this practice in general of eminent knowledge work practitioners, say Nobelists or something like this, Kind of turning their attention in their later days to uh, training and capturing meta knowledge <clears throat> in the way that's common in, say, ballet uh, or in piano practice. So that's just kind of framing the problem. That's 
Um, that's how Ericsson frames it. I, I think there, it is possible to make some progress here, though. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me maybe begin by pointing to what kind of skills might constitute the relevant activities in the knowledge work domain. You know, if, if we're talking about tennis, then there are a set of serves that are really important. There are also a set of just like core plyometric exercises, being able to launch yourself uh, in op opposing directions very rapidly and with very high endurance. Uh, what are kind of the analogs in knowledge work? Well, some that come to mind for me are um, uh, attention management, um, being able to um, sort of remain focused on what is the high value activity to you. Uh, uh, reading, uh, distilling, synthesizing information from others. <clears throat> uh, developing ideas over time from inklings into propositions, into say, theories, into plans of action. Um, communicating theories effectively to others. Uh, planning work effectively in groups, uh, things like this. And while each of these things is wicked compared to like plyometric exercises, um, we we can we can sort of evaluate some of these things. Um, and and here it, it it feels a little closer to evaluating like a pianist recital performance. Um, if I have a teammate in a in a professional setting and I observe them trying to communicate a, an idea that they have effectively to others, you know, perhaps I can evaluate that teammate's uh, practice in the way that uh, a panel of judges might evaluate um, like a, a graduate piano student's performance. Mm -hmm. um, now the, ne the next step would be something like, like now that, that piano student uh, in their sort of their classes, their instructor um, has a set of activities that they do uh, specifically for the purposes of improving their skill that they do with that instructor. And so like what might the analog be for knowledge work? Uh, well, we could imagine that there might be <clears throat> exercises one could do uh, about distilling and communicating uh, one's ideas effectively. Uh, could be daily writing exercises, perhaps. Um, there could be a corpus of, uh, of, say, writing challenges that one proceeds through. Um, religions have some analogs here, where there's sort of a daily study um, schedule that's like set out for, for some religious texts, and that's followed by adherence. Um, and so we might be able to develop uh, corpuses of activities um, along those lines for some of the core skills and knowledge work. Um, you'll be unsurprised to learn that, that I also think it's possible to develop environments which support uh, these skills, either in development or in execution practice. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's sort of a, a separate topic. I'm going to like stop talking and let you ask a different question. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. And I actually have a related question on the topic of notes. How important would you say your notes are to your learning and creative process? And as a follow-up to that, can you think of a concrete example of a breakthrough or some creative idea that was made possible by them and some complex things that you've been able to understand as a result of them? Sure, yeah. Um, so how important? Well, I've been writing seriously in this style for about a year and a half. Um, and so it can't be that important, right? Because I, I've been a, a practicing professional for you know, quite a long time, uh, and I've been <laughs> practicing without these notes uh, for that time. And, I, and I've done work and made progress. Um, Quantum Country was conceived without this note system. Um, so we should be skeptical of claims that um, mm. these notes are responsible for you know, any, any like, dramatic insights that, that you see from mm. me. Uh, because most of them are actually, uh, most of them predate the system. Uh, however, you know, what can we say about the efficacy of the note system? <clears throat> uh, and I, I should say, like, note practice, perhaps. It's not, it's not clear to me uh, the contribution of the system versus the practice. Um, but uh, the, the practice of diligently writing uh, in this style uh, daily has allowed me to more consistently make progress on um, inklings. I think that's the thing that I notice most. Uh, previously, there would be this very haphazard process wherein um, you know some some new idea would occur to me, perhaps in conversation or perhaps in reading, and I'd think like, oh, that's like that's neat, and like maybe I'd tweet about it. Um, 
and like that would kind of be the end of the story. And then <clears throat> the question of whether that idea got developed more seriously would really be a matter of like, did subsequent conversations in the coming months like happen to re-stimulate or trigger it? In which case I would probably like do some thinking out loud with that person and, uh, and then, oh good, like we'd push the idea forward a little bit. Uh, or, you know, maybe I'd read another book that would like stimulate a thought about the idea. But you know, if a year goes by and I don't run into any of those conversations then the idea kind of dies. Um, the, the other mechanism of, of course, uh, is occasionally we do kind of choose an idea to be like, wow, I'm gonna like drop everything and focus on this. Um, and and mm. so I, I, th I think traditional mechanisms actually serve that use case pretty well. I want to be clear that what I think they don't serve very well is is like these these very fragile, uh, unproven inklings, just like interesting stuff that comes up in conversation. Um, and that might seem innocuous, but but I think it's a big deal because I think that's actually where a lot of like important insights come from. Quantum country emerged from uh, two years of just conversations between Michael and me about tools mm. for thought and spaced repetition memory systems, where like various just little ideas were brought up in those conversations. And then a couple of months later, you know, it kind of come up in the next conversation. And so they naturally evolve. If we didn't have that, that operating cadence that was mm, causing us to develop those ideas, it's really not clear to me that it would have happened. So coming all the way back to the note system and the counterfactuals, uh, I am making more progress on a larger number of ideas now uh, than I ever had in my life. That's definitely true. Uh, it's I, I can I can see very clearly that there are kind of many new theories that are not merely me summarizing other people's ideas, but are um, which have some original component, uh, or at least an original framing, an original stance, um, which are making kind of steady progress. <clears throat> That's not something that historically, I would say happened consistently for me. Usually it'd be kind of like one, or like a small number of like big ideas and questions that I'd be exploring at any given time. Um, in terms of examples of things, uh, I don't know if y'all have seen like this Timeful Texts article that mm, yes. uh, I published a few months ago with Michael. Um, that uh, evolved in this very like consistent plotting way using this note writing practice over the course of many months where like a series of observations about media forms, about explorable explanations, and about some stuff I wanted to do with like video game design translated into communications media um, gave rise to some of those theories and those theories coalesced into that article. And actually there was a neat experience where um, that article is kind of short. Uh, I was giving quite a low word limit because it, it was for a, like a, an anthology. Um, mm. But uh, anyway, despite its brief length, it's about 1,300 words. It was written in like three hours um, because oh, wow. I had I had like hundreds of relevant notes. <laughs> 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 um, and just, just like by contrast, um, a similar essay uh, about three times as long, so not the best comparison, but I don't normally write stuff that short. Uh, why books don't work took me about uh, uh, about 80 hours. Wow. 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 And so that was pre your note system. That's why you feel that it took so long or okay. Yeah, that's that's I mean, like it, it, uh, it took long because I was doing the thinking while I wrote it. Like that's the key difference. Like mm -hmm. when I was writing Timeful Text, I had basically already done um, not all the thinking because of course like when you try to distill uh, complex ideas and like present them very cleanly with a narrative, um, new facets suggest themselves and new problems suggest themselves so, so you have to think a little more. But like 80% of the thinking was done. Whereas with Why Books Don't Work, like I had this idea and I was like, oh, this seems interesting. Maybe I should write an essay about it. And then like I did all of my thinking in the course of writing the essay. <laughs> Wow, that's. Uh, I'll just. I just have a quick follow up on that. You mentioned doing your thinking in the notes, and I was just curious about how important or how vital you think that is in terms of your thinking process. Do you view it as possible to think deeply about something now without taking notes about it and, and having that process? Or like, basically, what I'm asking is, what role does the actual note taking itself play in your thinking and and would you be able to think as deeply without them? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's hard to evaluate the counterfactuals. Um, my lived experience is that I'm able to develop ideas more effectively now than I have been previously. 
right. I haven't, I don't think I have developed or published any uh, really, really significant ideas since I began doing this. It's only been a year and a half. I think, uh, you know, if we're lucky, I get something really significant out of myself every three years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, ch check in in a couple of years and maybe we'll see something pretty significant. Um, I, I would say, like, the, the primary alternative in my life for developing ideas is conversation with colleagues. Right. Uh, and so this is like a, a supplement to that that performs more effectively in certain ways and less effectively in others. Right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. I have a question about <clears throat> sort of the role of non-traditional study tools and systems um, sort of alongside the uh, traditional education system. So do you think that the goal of these non-traditional study tools, such as the one you're developing right now, um, do you think that they should be aiming to integrate themselves and develop alongside the current educational system? Or do you think that they should try to challenge it and compete with it? Um, so for, for listeners who aren't aware, I spent five years kind of working in the context of traditional educational systems at Khan Academy. And um, when I left Khan Academy, it was my explicit intent to stop trying to think about uh, formal educational contexts. Mm -hmm. My reason for this was mostly a practical one. Um, Y'all have probably seen, you know, Peter writing about, uh, you know, anti-educationalism and kind of the, you know, all this illich stuff, that the tyranny of, of exactly. uh, education, de-schooling society, and so on. Um, uh, I, I do believe some substantial fraction of that. I am, like, slightly more pragmatic about that stuff, I think, than, than he is. But uh, from, from, like, a, a more practical perspective, I just found consistently when I was doing this work at Khan Academy that it's just incredibly difficult to make progress um, in that space. Uh, because there's this background noise that is really, really loud. And so, like, what you're doing is to overcome this kind of noise floor where we would come into a classroom with some very novel environment, mm. and we'd put it in front of these kids, and, like, most of the kids had already decided that they didn't want to be there, or, like, mm -hmm. they were thinking about other things. You know, like, this is not, this is not what they're about. Um, yeah. they, like, their goal was not to do the thing that like we put in front of them and so you know we can learn some things about like well did it work like, did they find it interesting um, but everything that we learned was like first off damped um, just like really tamped down in amplitude um, but second off just like really distorted and biased um, so I, I found it very difficult to get gradient uh, trying to make progress in that space and um, so my, my, my current practice is to basically not even take a side <laughs> on that issue. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to just like not pay attention to formal okay. educational context. Um, I, I do believe it's the case that progress on these tools and environments um, will help educational contexts, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't really want to think about them in that context because I think it'll make it harder for me to work. Okay, very interesting. So, rather than focusing on this traditional educational context um you've written in your notes that uh you feel like people who are interested in note-taking tools they they don't have a serious context of use so i'm assuming that you're trying to create tools for someone who does have a serious context of use and that sort of becomes your context for your work um so how would you define a serious context of use yeah and i i should qualify um I don't think that all people who are interested in note systems have don't have a serious context of use. I just think it's a common failure pattern um, that they become like uh, about the tool rather than about something serious. So what's a serious context of use? Uh, my, my favorite example here, and I should credit Michael for this one because I think it's very good, is that uh, uh, when, when the people at NASA were working on the Apollo program, um, they learned a lot and they uh, developed a lot of knowledge uh, and made a lot of progress, um, and like none of those things was the goal, right? Like the, the goal was to put people on the moon, um, and like a lot of good learning happened along the mm. way. That's a serious context. A lot of really serious tools and environments were developed uh, in the course of that context. Uh, that's great. Uh, let's talk about cathedrals. So uh, people who built cathedrals uh, developed some very, very important ideas about uh, architecture and civil engineering. Uh, but their goal was emphatically not 
to develop ideas about architecture and civil engineering, right? It was uh, you know, to build some space to glorify God. Uh, so those are serious contexts. Now, yeah, we, we don't have to be quite so, uh, uh, I don't know, emphatic uh, about our demands there. Uh, a more banal, serious context, this can be seen in quantum country. So uh, it, it's kind of maddening to me that if you look at the literature around spaced repetition, basically every single experiment, that's an exaggeration, the vast, vast majority of experiments are with these like manufactured scenarios. And yeah. I understand that people are, people are trying to control things, but you know, I was just reading a paper the other day that was like asking a bunch of undergrads to memorize English to Swahili translations uh, and, and then like trying to make something of their survey responses about, you know, how they felt when they were doing this. It's like those survey responses don't mean anything. Yeah, it's as close to nonsense syllables as possible. It's, yeah, yeah, very, I mean, nonsense syllables, of course. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so like quantum country, uh, like a couple of properties about that 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 are important are the first off um, it's a serious text so uh, many of many of my colleagues in the kind of like explorable explanation space similar space I've dabbled in um, have fallen into this trap as I see it of like writing these short articles like explainers on a topic um, to use as a context to explore some kind of like dynamic media idea that they have um, and and the problem that seems to occur with those articles all too often is that um, the article is just not serious enough. Like it, it's just not deep enough. And so the people viewing it are not that serious about like learning the thing. Uh, and so there just isn't enough pressure on the idea. Whereas like quantum country is earnestly trying to be uh, a useful uh, primer to quantum computing and like a person who wants to learn it, like could use that and like really understand a lot about it. And the other serious context of use there, um, is that it's it's intended for uh, a serious student trying to learn quantum computing in order to do something real in their life. So like we basically wrote it with graduate students in mind. That's excellent. Actually, on the on the topic of using spatial position for serious things, what is your view on the role of application prompts, especially since it t seems untenable to write them for yourself, and uh, also yeah. how you plan to integrate them into Orbit? Yeah, uh, these these are a mystery to me. I mean, these are a newer a newer idea. Um, <clears throat> we have some data on them now, uh, which is which is interesting, but um, I don't know enough about it. Okay, so for li listeners, uh, application prompts are this idea that we introduced in um, the final chapter of Quantum Country, wherein uh, instead of being asked like a memory question, like um, uh, memory question is the wrong term. Um, instead of being asked a question whose front and back are always the same, <clears throat> and so uh, a question which encourages you to remember the answer, uh, these are questions which are um, which in intentionally discourage memorization. Uh, and so they they are different every time you ask them up to some limit, at which point they cycle. But the intent is that they'll they kind of cycle around, you know, maybe twice a year at most. And uh, we use these. We call them application prompts because we use them to help you apply what you've learned. And so just as an example, uh, in, in quantum computing, like this might ask you to um, like evaluate the output of a circuit um, where that circuit is making use of some, <clears throat> some specific idea. Uh, and so you're, you're like applying that idea in a concrete way. And the next time you see that question, like you're seeing a different circuit that makes use of that idea or you're being asked to apply that idea in some different way. Um, so this is supposed to help transfer learning. Uh, Okay, so your your question was uh, how uh, how are they going to be integrated? What the role of them is, especially yeah. since they're hard to write for yourself, and also how yeah, they end up yeah. What's the role? I don't know. Um, so there's lots of questions we can ask. First is um, how valuable are they? Uh, do, do they actually uh, contribute understanding in a useful way um, beyond the recall prompts? We don't really know the answer to that. So I've, I've done some surveying and some interviewing. I mean, the subjective feeling of readers is that they, they do, uh, but that, that's not great. I'm not even really sure how to evaluate it. I mean, I think that what I'd like to do here um, in the, the coming months is something like have a transfer test uh, wherein we ask a bunch of like out of set questions for quantum country readers and uh, yeah, probably we'd hold out the application prompts for, for some subset of the readers and see 
you know, what impact that has on the transfer performance. That would be extremely um, interesting. Yeah, so we've done that for recall stuff. Um, so we have this like very interesting counterfactual data on recall. Um, we don't have counterfactual data on the application columns, so we don't have counterfactual data. Actually, we, we don't have either factual or counterfactual data on uh, transfer, um, which we need. So that's, that's you know, what do I know the role is? I don't, I don't know what the role is. What do I think the role is? Uh, I think it is important both emotionally and cognitively. Um, cognitively, uh, it's import important to help people um, generalize the knowledge that they've learned so that they can use it in many contexts. And these seem like a relatively affordable way to do that. Emotionally, one of the most common pieces of feedback that we got from people after we worked through uh, a lot of the earlier issues in quantum country was that people were uncertain whether they were just, basically people didn't feel confident in what they mm -hmm. learned. They were like, yeah, I know that I can come up with the answer in the context of this one question, but is that durable knowledge? Like, what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think it's actually the case that the knowledge was pretty durable and reliable and like mostly worked as people wanted with some exceptions that are kind of interesting. But uh, people didn't feel that it did. Uh, and that's actually also very important. So um, what's the forward plan? I, I don't know. So I, I'm working with some writers right now on new material in this medium and I'll probably try to have some of them write these kinds of prompts. They are hard to write. They're, they're kind of expensive. Um, but relative to the cost of writing a serious text, they're not that expensive. They're cheaper than writing textbook exercises, which are often much more elaborate. Uh, and certainly, if you're writing a text that you believe could be read by many thousands of people, um, your efforts scale. Uh, I don't know how they fit into uh, personal memory systems, right? So everything I've been saying has been assuming uh, that we're talking about an author who's writing a text that has these things embedded into it. Um, if I'm writing prompts for myself, uh, it's I, I do try to write prompts like this for myself, um, and it, it does it, like it just doesn't work very well. Uh, it's hard to surprise yourself, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how to get around that. And you asked uh, how are they integrated into Orbit? Well, like Orbit supports this type of prompt. Um, so Orbit supports a prompt that. Uh, 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 kind of tracks performance as a group, but which has many kind of constituent questions which rotate. Um, so like mechanically, uh, Orbit supports what Quantum Country does. Uh, oh, that's actually I think that the real question is is more like, what's it for? And <laughs> oh, yeah, <we> <laughs> actually, like, it, it seems promising. Country. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I can't imagine that it provides no value, but of course we'd have to see some data. And, and on that topic, you mentioned transfer, and I'm curious yeah. your thoughts on the importance <clears throat> of phrasing, not in application prompts, but just in ordinary prompts. What's the importance of phrasing yeah. for maximizing transfer? Yeah, yeah, I kind of, so I alluded to there being some places where we know transfer is poor, or like we're pretty sure transfer is poor in quantum country. And those are cases where a question has a distinctive, uh, there's, there's something distinctive in the structure of the question which uh, acts as a cue. Um, and so like one example is uh, there's only one who type question in the first chapter of Quantum Country. And so whenever anyone sees that question, they mm. can know that the answer is John Wheeler without reading or thinking about anything else about what's involved, right? It's just like if there's like a quantum country question about who, like the answer is John Wheeler. Uh, right. That's the worst one. There's some others that are kind of like that. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's not good. Um, <clears throat> and so a one application of the ampl application prompt uh, mechanism uh, is to simply vary the phrasing of the question. So th this would be a variation that, um, like the application prompts we were discussing uh, are a set of question answer pairs and uh, 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 a simpler version which might resolve the issue you're describing is like a set of questions all of which all have the same answer. Uh, 
a fellow um, Giacomo Rodozzo uh, suggested something pretty interesting to me about this, uh, which is that yeah, many of us have experimented with having GPT-3 write questions. You know, <laughs> it, it, it would be fun to be able to point it at some text and have it extract questions. Uh, the, <clears throat> the output I've gotten from my experiments, but that has been poor. Um, so he had a clever, yeah, he had a clever idea, which was maybe, um, what if you write the answer, and maybe you write a question also, uh, maybe you can have it write variations on the question, which are, like, conceptually the same, but syntactically different, mm -hmm. uh, and oh. GPT-3 is, is much better at that kind of transformation, like, just rephrasing sentences. Um, mm. And so, like, early tests there actually look pretty good. Uh, and that could be a way to, like, automatically generate um, kind of syntactic variations on, on questions. Um, you asked me, like, what, what do I think the, uh, the impact or the, the import uh, of, of these is? I don't know. I, 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 my, my instinct is that it's kind of at the margin. Um, there are definitely cases where it's causing this kind of, like, pattern matching thing, which is bad. Uh, my sense talking to people is that that's, like, 5 to 10 percent of prompts. Um, and so it's something that you'd want to address if you're getting really serious about this type of work, uh, but it's not, it's not like a high order bit. So it's not a priority for me. Mm. So do you have any questions that were phrased by GPT-3 in your system? No. Okay. No, this has all just been one off experiments. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So most people here are very familiar with SuperMemo and SuperMemo sure. is a pro, is a pro program that focuses a lot more on function than it does on form. That is to say, sure, that yeah. at times it is quite clunky. Um, yeah. From what I've seen of Orbit and, and your previous work and influences, you prioritize the form and design of systems very highly. Um, and so which parts of a space repetition system, a memory system, are the most important to focus on as a designer? Yeah. Um... I guess, okay, so a couple of things to say about that. There's, there's two important design challenges that I'm, or classes of design challenge that I'm interested in working on in this space, besides just making progress on the research questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, this is, this is like a, a, this is a representation design issue. Uh, what are the fundamental nouns and verbs here? So some amount of clunkiness is due not to colors or fonts or layout, but is rather simply due to um, the way that you carve the seams of the problem uh, is due to how you define what the primitives are in the system, what the fundamental actions are, uh, and how, how you group and arrange them. This is, this is what Alan Cooper calls interaction design. Um, and I think that we don't yet understand what the fundamental primitives in this space are. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some of the work that I'm doing is about that. There's just one example. This is fairly high level. I don't think anyone has created a successful representation of progress for these systems. Mm. Um, and I don't mean successful in like a it's aesthetically pleasing sense. I mean successful in like a, um, it resonates with lived experience and like reinforces the actions that you take on a day-to-day -day basis in a meaningful way. <clears throat> you know, so these systems will tell you like what the interval of the current prompt is and you can like get statistics and stuff, but um, it's like a um, database schema as interface design. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't really answer this deeper question of, like, um, what, what is the person's purpose in using this system? Uh, what authentic need in their life is it filling? What real goal do they have? And how do you frame their daily activities relative to that goal? Mm. And this isn't just a touchy-feely kind of problem. It plays out in ways that many people in this space have recognized. Uh, one key problem for the design of these systems is that uh, they seem like they don't work because uh, you spend most of your time practicing the cards that you are bad at 
uh, so your your day to day experience of mm. spaced repetition practice, especially if you're not adding a ton of new cards all the time, is like forgetting stuff and spending time with stuff that you forget. So it seems like the system isn't working very well. Um, and I, I encountered that not from theorists in spaced repetition systems, but like from readers early on in the quantum country uh, uh, work where I could see their progress. And I could see like, wow, this person has demonstrated retention at like a one month level or higher of you know, 90% of the content. But then I talked to them and they're like, well, yeah, I feel like I kind of remember stuff. You know, there's like a bunch of stuff that I struggle with. You know, like they just don't feel it. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the typical system approach of like showing the intervals is not sufficient. And, you know, my like first round solution to that was um, all the time when we're surfacing the progress or the status of an individual thing we need to be surfacing it in the context of the status of the whole. Um, and there's like many different ways you could frame status. Uh, for quantum country, we're experimenting with this metric we call demonstrated retention, which is like you reach the two week level at, in quantum country when you have demonstrated that you can remember the answers to all the questions for two weeks at a time. Uh, and so like at the end of every review session, we're showing you not how you did with the pumps today, um, but like your, your kind of your, your gestalt progress. And so you're getting the sense that you're making progress. And, and like interviewing users after we introduced that, like we stopped hearing these, these issues about people not feeling like they're making progress. So it's just one example of a place where like the fundamental nouns that we're using in the space are just not defined. Um, and, and that I think is the important design issue. Um, the other domain of design problems is probably the one that you were referring to, which is just like, aesthetics um <clears throat> how does it feel and uh it's kind of, kind of there's two there's two levels uh, about how i think about that uh okay one of them is like pragmatic and from a research perspective uh my like my core theory of production for myself like why why am i working in this space when lots of people have worked in this space uh, why do i think i will make progress uh, where they have not uh, is that in general um, academic researchers who make uh, software environments um, tend to make them with such a low degree of fidelity of execution that they cannot see how those environments behave in serious context of use uh, so the environments only end up getting used by um, their students or like the, the subjects that they pay to experiment with the environments or you know, maybe people in their lab or whatever. Right. Um, but uh, what this means is that they um, they can't really see their theory. Uh, so uh, the, the way that I think, the way that I'm excited about making progress is by this, um, this thing Michael and I have called the insight through making loop where um, you kind of have a theory about a domain like cognitive science. You express that theory, say the spacing effect, testing effect, getting expressed in, say, a set of nouns and verbs that you've designed into a system. Uh, and then hopefully, people's use of that system allows you to come up with better theories. Um, mm. it, it should allow you to think new thoughts in cognitive science and understand something about memory uh, that no one has understood before, which in turn should allow you to build better systems. And so the challenge for these academic systems is that um, that second uh, second half of the loop is inoperative. So uh, the systems don't actually meaningfully help them improve their theories often. Uh, and so uh, coming all the way back around to this like, question of design and form, um, yeah. this is a place where uh, aesthetics matter to some degree, and not just aesthetics, but like usability and just general issues of interaction design. Like you have to make a thing, uh, you have to execute a thing to a high enough level of fidelity that serious people can use it in serious use cases um, enough that you can see. So that's kind of the practical side of the aesthetics. And then the, the uh, other side of the aesthetics that I think is important um, is that I think basically everyone in this space systematically underrates emotion. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, emotion is carried out in, in kind of the, the personality, the experience, and the voice. Uh, the emotional experience of using the thing is, is uh, 
just as important as the, the cognitive experience um, because the the at least in space repetition systems in particular like the number one challenge is that like people don't stick with it and people tend not to like find it valuable like you know some small number of people do there's like 25 of you in this room but like yeah, that's, 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 that doesn't matter uh, so uh the form of the system is a way to uh, set the stage for and participate in the emotional experience Very interesting. Did I, I actually answer your question? I, 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 I'm not really sure. <laughs> no, that, that was excellent. That was excellent. It was good to get. Um, <laughs> it was really deeper than I was expecting. It was very nice. Yeah. Yeah. All of these answers have been fantastically thorough. So we appreciate that, I think. Uh, to go back to some prompt related stuff, you have a note about unusual applications of spatial repetition prompts. And I was curious, what are some of your favorites from that list? Let's see. Um, sure. So, like favorites in, um, you know, there's there's favorites in different senses. So, uh, one axis of favorite is like most powerful, um, and this is one that that y'all are probably pretty familiar with because you're like super memo power users. But um, yeah, I mean, being able to use these prompts to uh, promote cognitive tasks that are not recall oriented. So, writing a prompt that's like uh, take a recent uh, ethical decision that you made and uh, evaluate it from a deontological perspective is like an example of a prompt I have. Uh, mm. That's incredibly powerful. You know, that, that's something that takes like a, an isolated concept that I learned when I was like, you know, studying the history of philosophy um, and kind of continuously applies it to my, to my everyday life. Uh, so I, I think that's like the most powerful of these, the, the, and being able to create like synthesis and and uh, generative prompts. Um, uh, 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 yeah, being able to uh, some of these unusual objects for recall tasks. So like uh, studying past decisions and uh, past like important moments has been pretty useful when I've like made career changes or I, I've been surprised by someone else's behavior. Uh, trying to unpack that uh, in, in this way has been quite helpful. It's not really clear to me how much of the value, and this is like a, a common question for a lot of space repetition stuff, it's not clear how much value comes from this kind of structured way of writing uh, that makes you think very carefully when you're writing the questions uh, and how much value comes from uh, actually engaging with the questions over time um, with something like uh, like I got a grant last year and um, I was excited about it but I also didn't know how to feel about it because like I wasn't really seeing funding and I wanted to actually not think about funding and so I was felt kind of conflicted and and then I, I saw this like interesting thing about the grant that, that kind of made it a reason for excitement that was surprising to me that I hadn't thought about before and like that reason was that um, uh, it was a grant that was awarded by um, someone outside of my field, uh, outside really anything even adjacent to my field, uh, that still thought the work was interesting. Um, and I thought, like, well, it's really interesting, like, uh, kind of as a uh, as a heuristic or as a metric that um, that like experts in other fields find your work interesting. Um, so that's like an instance where like a past experience mm -hmm. and a reflective time uh, kind of helped me form like a new theory, like a new lens. Uh, and I like I encoded that into a prompt, and you know that that was kind of useful. <clears throat> that is fantastic. I I think to me those those non-memory related prompts are more, even more interesting than the memory prompts in a lot of ways. And uh, I guess I'll just ask one more prompt related question since we're on it. Uh, what is your intuition for how long it takes to develop a skill set for writing good prompts? And I know you're probably working with writers since. Orbit works on pre-written questions by the writers. And also you yeah. mentioned that users of Quantum Country find the questions within to be useful templates for writing their own. And I was curious if you think there's a broad enough set of questions that would provide enough templates, or is creativity always required at some level? <clears throat> so how long does it take to develop this skill? Uh, how long is a piece of string? You know, so I, I, I have met many people who have tried 
like several abortive attempts to to do these systems over many years. Uh, who when I like asked them about you know some prompts like how do you think about prompt writing like they still seem to not really understand anything about it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a little bit like you know like a person who takes up piano when they're a kid and like they kind of play occasionally but they still like they can't really play right. So like mm -hmm. how long does it take to learn piano? Well, it takes that person decades. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then on the other hand. Um, With scaffolds, maybe not that long. So I, I've talked to a number of people for whom quantum country was their first experience with space repetition systems, but like kind of inspired by it, they went and you know downloaded their own space repetition system and started writing prompts. And my impression of many of those people is that they, they've actually kind of like bootstrapped themselves to being able to like encode conceptual abstract knowledge uh, pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of in a matter of a few months, maybe. Uh, my my personal experience is that it took me. Uh, well, like first off, uh, I still don't feel like I'm very good at it, and um, it's very effortful writing good prompts. Mm -hmm. And um, I still don't like a lot of the prompts that I write, and I'm still like learning new techniques all the time. I've been doing this for not that long in the scheme of things, like, maybe three years. Um, I would say I was very bad at it for at least a year. Uh, I benefited from having uh, Michael as a friend, and we just talk about this stuff all the time. And so um, he probably helped me learn a lot faster. Uh, as far as working with authors, um, authors are very thoughtful about writing already and about representing ideas in writing. So uh, my exchanges so far with authors suggest to me that it's going to take a lot of work to help them write questions well, but that it's it's not going to be something that will take them years. Like I think it's something that uh, so far, like a few back and forths with me about like some questions they're writing and like here's how I would write it, you know, like, and here's why and so on, uh, has mm -hmm. kind of gotten to a point where like, yeah, okay, they, they seem to kind of get it. So uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to like run a workshop about this uh, in the next few months, probably several oh, workshops, wow. I don't know. Cool. Uh, and I'm trying to use that as a context to like write, I don't know if it's an essay or a guide or a book, <laughs> who knows what these things turn into, about that topic for authors. Um, and then hopefully once that's written, then like people can just read that and uh, then write questions quickly. I I don't know. Think of it as like a like a book length version of uh, Peter's like you know twenty tips for encoding knowledge type stuff. That would be amazing. Is that going to be public or is that exclusive to the writers or? Oh, I, I expect it to be public. Yeah. That'll be fantastic. That's awesome. And I guess Very interesting. Just, just one more related question: What benefit do you think is conferred by the fact that they're making items? or prompts from their own writing. I found that it's typically much easier to make them from my own writing. So do you think that makes it a lot easier or? I don't know. I hadn't thought of that actually. That's interesting. I don't find it easier to make prompts from my own writing. Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. <Yeah. laughs> actually, and I'll just direct people. Andy has an article on making some prompts from a set of articles from meaningness.com, I believe. And those are some very good questions if you're interested in these kind oh, of scaffolds or templates, you might find those valuable. Yeah. Oh, sorry, and you asked me, like, uh, will, will there, this is a this is a good question, actually, and I, I've been thinking about it. Will, will there ever be, like, a, just, like, templates you can use, you know, or is it always this, like, essentially creative act? Um, right, right. Uh, I, I, I think there's, I, I think that's an important question, and, and my sense is that there's actually uh, kind of an important role for both. So I, I have noticed that there are, like, moves that I make, in the same sense that there's, like, moves that you make as a writer. Um, but maybe slightly more formulaic, where there's certain kinds of knowledge encoding uh, that can fairly consistently use the same types of prompts. Uh, and so I think there will be some corpus of moves like that, and maybe they're even uh, as consistent as a template uh, that people can use and that really accelerates this. And then, like, inevitably, there's, there's always a lot of stuff that uh, is not of that kind. Uh, I think there will remain a, a large set of uh, important types of prompts which are not, uh, which resist templatization. Right. Well, I'm I'm very excited about that uh, workshop or book or whatever comes of it. So I look forward to Let's that. <laughs> <laughs> so once you learn to write prompts or you're able to acquire high quality prompts, for example, from these authors, SRS enables you to acquire knowledge at greater speeds and retain greater volumes of information over time. Um, I'm interested in your opinion on what the optimum strategy is for directing our time to certain subjects. In particular, I'm interested in what you have to say about 
specialists versus specialists versus generalists. So I have this greater capacity for learning knowledge. Should I use it to go extremely deep into one subject or should I spread my time across lots of different subjects? Yeah. <clears throat> I think of SRS as being downstream of learning activities. Um, and so I'll redirect the question to like what types of learning activities should we engage in? And you know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it shifts around the efficacy of, of various learning activities. You know, like SRS makes certain learning activities effective that wouldn't have been before. You know, certain things are higher return. Um, so there's some influence there. But um, it hasn't really changed the fundamental mix in my mind for me. So I, I guess like the way that I think about learning is um, as always being in service of curiosity and um, serious projects. So like stuff goes, I, I study topics that I find fascinating. Uh, or that I think I might do something with. Um, I, I tend not to, um, that's not even the right phrase. Like, it doesn't feel like study. Like, I get fascinated with things, and then I, ended up, I, and then I end up learning stuff about it. It's, it's like a better way to describe it. Like, I get interested in space repetition memory systems, and I'm like, I, I read a bunch of papers because I want to know things, and then the, I learn things from the papers, and then those things go into SRS. Um, uh, I don't tend to like bank knowledge or like study um, for the sake of studying or like study because I think I might go into this field or something like study in preparation. Um, I, I try to do the thing uh, and then I, I like learn in response to what is interesting or what is needed to do the thing. I don't know how universal that is. I mean, that in some sense, that's a very uh, that's a very programmer's mindset. Uh, is a uh, generalist versus specialist um i don't know what to say about that i mean I, I think it is a very common failure mode for people in this community to just want to learn all the things and kind of be knowledgeable in a jeopardy like way and you know, like know the capitals of all the countries and whatever and like i view that as uh as kind of silly you know if, if it generates meaning for for you then great um so somewhat more seriously, like in your work or like for your ambitions, is it better to be, for, for your ambitions, for, for what you find meaningful, is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? Uh, that probably depends on your domain of study. Um, th there's like a very common thing that people say that I think is true, uh, which is that uh, a really good strategy seems to be to be an eminent performer in a domain and quite a strong performer in like a couple of other domains uh, that seem to um, combine in a useful way, right? So like, I'm sure you've heard that many times, that's nothing new. Uh, I, I should note though that that strategy is very different from the ambition of being a generalist. Um, it, like it doesn't mean like, ah, oh, like I'll just, I'll get at all the things. Here's a sense in which being a generalist is very helpful though. Like, uh, I work independently uh, right now, you know, I'm working with authors and so on, but, um, you know, for my current research, being able to do kind of like the background research, uh, the kind of design of the systems from like a high level, the execution of the systems, both technically and like from a design perspective, the operation of the systems, and also like the, the post hoc analysis. Um, that's like pretty magical mm. to like be able to do all of those things as one person. You know, sometimes it's kind of slow because like I'm doing everything, but uh, being able to keep it all in my head uh, is quite valuable. Excellent. So, so just real quick, I just want to do a quick time check. Do you still have some time? We want to be respectful and not take too much of your time here. Yeah, let's do like one or, one or two more questions. I should get back to work. Okay. Um, actually, on the topic of, of these kind of notes you write, how do you take notes while reading? Because in your live stream, you appear to be taking notes purely from memory. And you've alluded to <laughs> having an, an unending pile of books that you've read but not taken notes from. So yeah. 
is it accurate that you're taking notes from memory? And if so, did you have to develop that skill or? I'm not taking notes from memory. Uh, even in that video, uh, I've got the book in front of me and I'm like referring to it uh, a number of times. Um, mostly what I do, uh, when I read, I am, uh, I am making, what phrase shall I use? I'm making markings uh, that help me find uh, meaningful stuff later. Basically, I'm like indexing the book as I read. Uh, and I'm trying to extract any general kind of questions or insights or whatever that I want to write more about. So like I went into that live stream with a fair, <laughs> not actually a fairly clear, with a, uh, a somewhat clear sense of like the, mm, the space I wanted to clarify. Like th there, were, there were a specific set of pages that said a specific set of things that generated conflict for me and I wanted to like do some work with those. Um, and so while I'm reading, I am uh, marking those pages or like extracting those elements that I want to do something with later. Uh, and then the, like those end up in a writing inbox at some time later. Uh, and how that, how they do that kind of depends on the medium. So like if I'm reading on my computer, which uh, I, I do a lot for, for ease of citation and so on, um, then I'm probably like making those extractions as I'm writing. Uh, if I'm reading a physical book, then um, I am writing on the back page and I'm writing in the margins. Uh, and when a page contains something uh, that I'm pretty sure I want to write about, then I put a star next to it and I turn down the corner of the page. And so I end up with like an index of the pages that uh, are important for, for writing about. And uh, to be clear that for, for most, most books I read, that's like not that many things, you know, there's maybe a dozen things that I'd write about. Um, and then many books, I, like I'll go through that process of like, you know, highlighting, highlighting is not the right word, marking, turning down corners, making a little index. I'll finish the book and I'll just not feel that inspired. Uh, you know, it's just kind of like, yeah, those things were kind of interesting. This is kind of bottom of the pile and it just goes back on the shelf. And sometime later, if I feel like the book becomes more relevant, then I'll pull it off, pull it out again, you know, look at those things I've turned down. Uh, Right. All of this is different from um, explicitly trying to learn about a topic, like careful study. Um, so, for instance, I did some, like, careful study of like, deliberate topics and deliberate practice um, early in the year. Um, and that's very different. That's, like, uh, several passes on the source material. Like, I'll read the source material, making some markings, and then, like, I'll read it again more carefully. Uh, kind of noticing the questions that arise and the key ideas. I'll kind of like try to make a map of the key ideas and then I'll try to um, ex explain the subset of those ideas that seem relevant to my work in my own words, like in my note system. And that's something that takes like tens of hours for, you know, right. for like that, a single piece. That makes piece. a lot of sense. I was, I was amazed when I was watching the live stream thinking that you were <laughs> recalling most of it from memory and I was just no amazed by that but that makes sense no my memory is not I'll very good it. oh yeah I mean I, I that's why I was confused or amazed because I, I had the same experience but I'll ask a related question and then pass it off to James for the final one what was your experience of incremental reading I know you don't you don't find it particularly um sticky for you in terms of a habit but what was your experience of it yeah no I mean I, I think it's I think it's really really interesting um and and I've actually I've developed uh, like a prototype system uh, to try to make some progress on it. But that's kind of lower priority for me right now, so I haven't returned to it. Um, my experience is I was very interested in and uh, rewarded by the kind of sense of freedom that one has when, you know, one can just read a bit of an article and then feel like, ah, I'm kind of done with this and then move on to the next. Um, sense of freedom relates to a topic I've written about a lot, which is trying to make destructive actions uh, lower stakes. So like, there's this problem when reading, even when reading a physical book, that you kind of feel like if you put it down, um, like you put it back on the shelf. Actually, this is ridiculous. Like I have a book on my coffee table right now, uh, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm committed to it. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like if I 
put it back on my shelf, then I will not read it. And it's like, that's like probably kind of true. Uh, like maybe I won't read it for a couple of years or something. Uh, and so like it sits on my coffee table uh, until I, you know, make some more concerted decisions. So like that was something that I think really uh, works is too strong, but is, is very interesting about incremental reading. Um, like my, my broad sense is that uh, the nouns and verbs are wrong as concretized in super memo. Um, it's not the right, uh, it's not the right grain. It's not the right workflow. I don't understand it well enough to criticize it. Um, so instead, I, I kind of step back to the aspiration of this kind of like um, this this feeling of freedom when reading. This feeling of being able to put something aside, and uh, like th there's no cost to doing that. Right. Uh, that seems really valuable, and so I'm interested in kind of trying to figure out what primitives make sense from there. All right, that makes sense. Very interesting. Have the last question here. I have the last question, and it's from Piotr, and it's oh, cool. about. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We save the best till last. <laughs> um, it's about a new, it is a bit of a wacky one. Um, Great. It's about a new idea he'd been working on, he'd been discussing it with friends, and I guess I'll just quote literally what he said. Sure. Um, I just spoke with friends about converting the whole operation of humanity into a huge concept network. People would operate as neurons, define their needs, define their interests, and define uh -huh. their capacity. They will organize into an efficient network of cooperation and knowledge exchange. We need software infrastructure to implement it. What do you think, Andy? Cool, yeah. Um, the, this ambition, or something akin to this ambition, uh, has been described by a number of folks in the collective intelligence and networked intelligence communities. Uh, so. Um, uh, those might be interesting uh, kind of key, key terms to begin reading around. Uh, my sense is that we, as of yet, lack the uh, lack the framing which allows us to express the kind of core attributes and operations. Uh, needed for a successful system of that kind. Some of the most interesting work I've read in this space is actually from uh, military operations research. As you might imagine, they need to coordinate large numbers of people and effectively processing large amounts of information. And uh, they have figured some things out about how to do this. Uh, one of my other favorite things uh, I've read in this space uh, it was actually written by my colleague, uh, Michael Nielsen, in Reinventing Discovery. He describes uh, the contours of a system which might facilitate managing, coordinating expert attention across networks, um, which is kind of like a sub-problem of what you're describing, but I think an important sub-problem of essentially, like, I come into work, and what should I... What should I give my attention to today? Hmm. Uh, should it be some problems I was interested in? Should it be some problems from this person I don't know, but uh, who is given a lot of status by people I value? Uh, should it be an economic system? Should it just be you know whatever I feel like? But if it's whatever I feel like, like what are the inputs that I'm consuming in order to produce uh, those instincts? I found reading Michael's description very stimulating. I'm kind of riffing on it here. And so one thing that makes me think with respect to this, this broader aspiration of networked intelligence is that we would probably be helped by uh, characterizing sub-problems. Like, so if we think one sub-problem is this problem of attention, uh, what are the other sub-problems or other subsystems we might ask, and how might they relate? Very interesting. Would you be interested in uh, developing software infrastructure to implement that sort of thing? Uh, I mean, interested, sure. I think it's potentially very high value. Uh, uh, I actually was just expressing this recently to Connor of Rome, 
uh, the challenge that I have when thinking about this space is that I worry our ideas about the underlying domain are not powerful enough. So as a system designer, the thing that you are doing is reifying theories or ideas about some underlying domain. In the case of space repetition, you are reifying theories about the spacing effect and the testing effect and certain other kind of properties of, of learning. And um, those happen to be powerful ideas, and so you're able to make some pretty powerful systems. Uh, in the case of network intelligence, I fear that we simply don't understand the underlying space well enough, and we don't have sufficiently powerful theories to build systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when, when fields find themselves in that situation, usually what needs to happen is like a, is like a bunch of vibration as people kind of bounce around in their respective spaces and come up with ideas and try them and tinker and you know maybe eventually we get some insight uh, but it's difficult to launch like a concerted effort without a foundation you know like I guess like a counterfactual that's interesting to think about is could I write a proposal to be a DARPA program officer in this problem space? Mm. Uh, you know, could I throw five or ten million dollars at this problem constructively? What is the largest amount of money that I think I could constructively throw at this problem in a given year? And right now it's like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars maybe. Mm. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I don't think enough is known. People just need to tinker. Interesting. I think Wiles will be excited by the idea of continued tinkering. That's all he does. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to kind of wrap this up here, I just want to say thank you for this. I'm a huge fan of your work. You've changed my thought oh, process a lot. I think that's, that's true of a lot of people here. Definitely. We're very grateful for this. And on that note, how can people support your work if they're not familiar with it already? Where, where could they go to find more about it? That kind of thing. Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, um, right. So uh, I, I do have like a research community thing. And so you can you can follow along with my work and get like inside updates and stuff. Uh, if you join my Patreon, um, I, have, I have like a crowdfunded research grant. It's like a weird thing. Uh, <laughs> so if you chip in a, a couple of bucks to that, then you'll be able to kind of get some behind the scenes stuff, see what I'm up to, uh, help me do my work. So you can find that uh, at patreon.com slash quantum country. Uh, and you can find just more about my work in general at uh, andymatushak.org. Beautiful. Thank you again. This was, for me at least, an enlightening discussion. I know some other people here wanted to know some of the answers to some of these questions. So, again, thank you. We appreciate this. Absolutely. Thanks for hanging out. Have a great day, y'all. Awesome. You too.